right, folks, welcome back. We are done with that pesky biochemistry unit. We're going to move on to cellular biology now. So we're going to take a look at different types of plant and animal cells and the organelles that are inside those plant and animal cells. So we're going to take a look at that today and get to our objectives. Today you're going to be able to know the anatomy and physiology of a cell. Each, much like the body, the body has different parts to it, and each part has its own task to make the body function. And it's the same thing with the cell. In the cell there are different organelles, and those organelles allow the cell to function. So you're going to see a lot of similarities between the human body and a cell. Additionally, we're going to be able to differentiate between different types of cells. This includes things like plant cells versus animal cells. What are the similarities? What are the differences? Uh, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, two big terms that mean very different things. So let's dive right in because we got a lot to cover today. So let's look at a couple different cell types. The first one is what's called a prokaryote. Prokaryotes do not have membrane-bound organelles. They do not have a nucleus. So if you look to the right, we've got an animal cell, a plant cell, and a bacterial cell. And at the bottom, you have a bacterial cell, and that is a prokaryotic cell. You see there's not a lot of complexity to it. There's um, you know, a few things here and there that are inside of it. You've got the chromosomes, ribosomes, some cytoplasm, uh, a cell wall, but there's not nearly as much stuff on the inside. That stuff is called organelles. So prokaryotes, no membrane-bound organelles, and no nucleus. Eukaryotes, things like plant and animal cells, both have nuclei. Um, they both have different things like mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, all kinds of different organelles inside of it that help it function. Another thing to differentiate between the two is that prokaryotes are typically single-celled organisms. So things like bacteria are typically prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotes are typically multicellular, so things like plants, animals, most of those are multicellular organisms. So prokaryotes, you're looking at things that are single-celled like bacteria. Eukaryotes, you're looking at multicellular organisms like animals and plants. So make sure you know the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Specifically, we look at the prokaryotic cell structure. Again, remember prokaryotes are things like bacteria. They don't have any organelles on the inside of it, so they don't have all the fancy machinery that eukaryotic plant and animal cells do. The DNA is in a circle or simply just free in the cell. There's no nucleus that contains the DNA. So the DNA is just kind of roaming around inside the cell. The cell wall is rigid, which makes it very difficult to get into. So things like antibiotics, the way they work is by destroying the cell wall. And that way the bacteria ends up dying. So you can see prokaryotic cell structure is pretty simplistic. You've got some DNA in the center, you've got a cell wall on the outside, but really aside from that, there's not a whole lot to a bacterial cell. Eukaryotic cells have uh, many organelles, each with its own function. So the eukaryotic cell can do a lot more things than the prokaryotic cell can. And that's just because it has all these different organelles that perform different functions that we will look at a little bit later on within the unit. Eukaryotic cells are also typically multicellular. So again, things like plants and animals are multicellular. So most of them are eukaryotic. And it's much larger than a prokaryotic cell. So we see a lot of differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, um, primarily the presence of organelles within the eukaryotic cell. And those organelles perform a lot of tasks that prokaryotic cells simply just cannot do. So let's look at some organelles in um, some more specific detail. The first one we want to look at is the plasma membrane, and that's the flexible boundary between the cell and the environment. Animal cells have a plasma membrane. Your cells have a plasma membrane surrounding each and every one of them. This allows materials to go in and out of the cell. It's kind of like the border patrol, if you will. It allows certain things that it wants in, certain things that need to come out, come out. Uh, plants and animals have plasma membrane. However, plant cells also have a cell wall on the outside of the plasma membrane. So just a couple of things to think about. Animal cells do not have a cell wall. Plant cells do. All right, but both of them have a plasma membrane. That plasma membrane allows things to come in and come out of the cell freely. The nucleus, you're probably familiar with this. This is the, the control center of the cell. Um, and this also keeps the DNA. The DNA, 95% of the time, is inside of the nucleus. Um, and there's also little small 
a smaller part of the nucleus, the even more central part, that is called the nucleolus. And the nucleolus actually makes ribosomes, and ribosomes are another organelle that we're going to take a look at a little bit later on. But the nucleus is primarily the control center of the cell. It controls all of the functions that go on inside the cell, while the nucleolus makes ribosomes. And ribosomes are important for protein synthesis, or making proteins and enzymes. And we'll take a look at that a little bit later on as well. Ribosomes, which we just talked about, made in the nucleolus, they produce proteins from DNA instructions. So this is where all of the different proteins in your body get made, and that's coded within your DNA. The cytoplasm is just a clear fluid. It's the clear jelly-like fluid that's inside the cell, and it's kind of the um, just the stuff that's inside of it that's not organelles, essentially. So cytoplasm, just that clear liquid that you see inside of the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum. You can see that that's a site of a lot of just different cellular reactions. A lot of different things are going on inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. A lot of, um, just a lot of movement of materials, a lot of different chemical reactions are occurring there. Um, there's there two different types of endoplasmic reticulum. They're smooth and rough. Smooth typically makes things like lipids, and those lipids then go to the plasma membrane, which we'll talk about a little bit later on as well. And there's also rough endoplasmic reticulum. Rough endoplasmic reticulum is rough because of the ribosomes. You see that the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on it, therefore it's a part of the cell where proteins are actually being produced. All right, And then those proteins go into the endoplasmic reticulum and they are moved to different parts of the cell as needed. So the endoplasmic reticulum, there are two types, smooth and rough. Smooth generates lipids and rough typically generates proteins and they're moved throughout the cell as needed. The Golgi apparatus ships proteins and materials to other parts of the cell as well as other cells. So the Golgi apparatus acts very much like the post office, if you will. It takes a lot of the materials that are needed inside of the cell and just moves them to different locations depending upon where things are needed. It's similar to the endoplasmic reticulum. It's just that the Golgi's primary goal is to move the material throughout the cell. Vacuoles are temporary storage. So in a vacuole, you're going to find all kinds of different materials that are stored inside of the cell that may not be needed immediately. Uh, they may be packaged to leave the cell or something that the cell has just received. So vacuoles provide storage for the cell. Lysosomes digest old cell parts. You've probably heard of Lysol and how it destroys bacteria, you know, when you spray it on your countertops and whatnot. That's where the term lice comes from, is to destroy. So lysosome destroys or digests old cell parts, and then those macromolecules, hopefully a term that you remember, and those biochemicals can actually be reused for other parts of the cell. So it's kind of like a, a recycling plant inside the cell. It's pretty convenient and pretty cool to think about all the stuff that the lysosome does. The mitochondria is a really important part of the cell. It creates energy. And that's something that's really important because without energy, the cell would not be able to function. We'll talk a little bit about the process cellular respiration that occurs inside of here a little bit later on, but you notice that there's a lot of folds inside of the mitochondria, and that's really important for cellular respiration. But the key thing to remember is that mitochondria is what helps generate the energy, or ATP, that's necessary for the cell to survive. A couple more organelles we're going to take a look at. One is the, the cytoskeleton, and that's kind of what provides the structure for the cell. It's what provides the support. It's so that the cell kind of doesn't fall into itself. And you've got microtubules and microfilaments, and each one of these has its own unique task. We're not going to get into a lot of detail about that, but I just want you to keep in mind that there's a cytoskeleton, just like how our own bodies have skeletons that provide our body support. Uh, the cytoskeleton provides support for the cell, so it's a really important thing for the cell as well. Centrioles. Centrioles are involved with cell division. It helps pull apart DNA. So in the process of mitosis, again, I'm, I know we're going through a lot of vocabulary that we may not necessarily be familiar with right now, but I want you to kind of understand how the big picture plays here. Uh, the centrioles are involved in cell division and pull that DNA apart. So during mitosis, DNA actually gets pulled apart to make two similar or genetically identical cells. And so the centrioles play an important role by creating what's called spindle fiber that attaches to the DNA and pulls them apart. So a real key thing you just need to keep in mind for now is that centrioles are involved with cell division. We'll get a little bit more into mitosis later on. Some things that help with cellular movement, 
Uh, we have cilia, which are just little short hairs on the outside of the cell membrane. And these little short hairs can help do a lot of different things. They can help the cell with movement. Um, they can help move things along the outside of the cell, bring things closer to the cell, push things away. So cilia are just little tiny short hairs on the outside of the cell. The flagella, the flagella is this long tail that tends to whip to help move the cell along. So for example, typically uh, eukaryote, most eukaryotic cells don't have flagella, but uh, bacterial cells, some of them do. And that flagella actually helps to move the bacterial cell along. You see these in some other single-celled organisms as well. So we got cilia, which are short hairs, and flagella, which is kind of like the tail of the cell. It aids in uh, cellular movement. A couple things that are specific to plant cells, all the ones that we've talked about are found in both plant and animal cells. Um, but these are just specific to plant cells. And we look at the cell wall, and that supports and protects the cell. You, know, you think about the, uh, the cell wall on the outside of plants, and you think about how hard some of the plants are. Uh, it makes sense to think that they probably have something rigid on the outside that protects it. So a cell wall is present in all plant cells. Additionally, there are chloroplasts, and chloroplasts perform photosynthesis. If you remember from your middle school biology days or middle school science days, chloroplasts help convert sunlight into chemical energy. So we don't find chloroplasts in animal cells because we can't just lay out into the sun and gain, photo, you know, gain energy from photosynthesis. That certainly would be nice, but that's not the case with us. But plant cells do that. That's how they obtain their energy. Remember, they're autotrophs. They make their own energy. And they do that by taking sunlight and um, absorbing it within the chloroplast and using that to make some chemical energy. All right, we'll talk about photosynthesis later on as well. So, I know we covered a lot, and we're going to go through some more details on the different parts of the cell because that's a really important part of this unit to know what each part does. So, by the end of this, you're going to know the anatomy and physiology of a cell, and hopefully you're able to differentiate between some plant and animal cells. We're going to go over each organelle probably a couple more times, and uh, we'll give you some assignments to work on. Make sure you take your video quiz and uh, work really hard so that you can get a really good grade of that mastery quiz and on the exam at the end of this unit. Have any questions, let me know. Take care, guys. We'll talk to you later.